Well, good morning, everyone. Good, good to see y'all. I don't know how well my voice will carry. Um, I, at least in my mind, I don't think it carries very well, but uh, I will try to project. It is good to see y'all this morning and uh, really thankful for the opportunity that uh, have to be here. Uh, so thankful for uh, all of the ladies that help make this possible and help setting up and, and you know, for all of you and the, the ways in which you've uh, brought food or contributed in one way or another, just thankful for that. And so uh, these are certainly special times uh, to be uh, together, at least for you all as ladies. And I'm thankful to the Lord that we're able to have these, these women's brunches. And so, again, thanks to all the ladies who have made this possible. Thanks to um, uh, Brother Bill. Bill Gillespie for being here with the emergency response team, and so thankful that he's here. And uh, if you uh, see Bill afterwards and you tell him thank you, um, I'm, he, he, he's not telling me to say this, but I'm sure he'd appreciate it. And so he's, uh, but uh, yeah, thankful for Bill, and uh, yeah, thankful for the time we've had, you have had, to have uh, lots of good, yummy food, and uh, now we get to have uh, even better food in God's Word. And so we're going to spend some time considering uh, God's Word this morning uh, with one another, and then afterwards we'll have a time uh, of discussion uh, that will be broken off into uh, after the fact. Is that right with the schedule? Okay. Uh, and then maybe a time for prayer as well, and then a time for prayer as well. And so, but uh, we'll go ahead and jump in with a word of prayer and uh, then dive into our study. Father, we're thankful for who you are. Uh, you are the great God that we serve, and Father, we are so un, it's so undeserved. Uh, that we would be able to serve such a great God as you are. Uh, Father, we recognize that it is by your grace in Christ alone that that is a reality, and we praise you for it. And we're thankful that we get to spend forever praising you for that reality, for your greatness and the great love that you have shown towards us in Christ, because you're worthy of that. And uh, we're so thankful that you have brought us to a place where we see that clearly. Father, we're thankful for the time uh, that uh, we have together this morning to spend in your word. Uh, Father, we pray that you would bless the time and that as bodies have been nourished by this physical food, that we would be nourished even more so through your word. Uh, I pray that you would renew our minds, that you would refresh us in yourself this morning, and that we would be even further equipped uh, as we live uh, throughout this day to honor you and and bring you honor and praise. Lord, we're thankful for this time. We're thankful for these women's brunches. We're thankful for all the hands that have gone in to make this possible. And uh, Father, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, as I mentioned before, it is a, it's a joy to be with you all. It always is a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, as has been mentioned, I believe before, we are launching into a new series of study today. And so kicking off a new series for these women's brunches uh, throughout the year of 2023. And uh, the, the topic of study, the topic of consideration is the fruit of the Spirit. And... Uh, at which point some of you are immediately excited, the fruit of the Spirit. You may have a song you have memorized with the fruit of the Spirit. You have lots of notes that you've taken on the fruit of the Spirit. You've heard lots of messages about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, for some of you, the fruit of the Spirit is regularly on your mind. And there are probably others of you out there that are thinking, why? Why the fruit of the Spirit? Why not, why not another topic? There are you know, seemingly an infinite number of topics you could choose from. Why the fruit of the Spirit? And one of my goals this morning and, and prayers is that if, if that's you, if you're in the why camp, that you would be moved into the I'm excited camp. Um, and I'm not going to be able to do that by my rhetoric, uh, but my prayer is that God would do that for you and in you through His Word. And so that's where we're going to be this morning, in His Word. If you have a Bible, it will be in Galatians chapter 5. If you don't, I'll be reading the verses out loud, um, uh, but uh, know that we will be in Galatians chapter 5. And uh, what I really want for you to see is the high value that God places upon this topic. And so uh, Galatians chapter 5 again. Uh, I think that oftentimes when we think of the book of Galatians, we think of salvation. Uh, we think of justification by faith and not of works, and understandably so. Uh, that is the heart and kernel of this book. Um, but uh, one of the, the fruits, uh, pun intended, is, is of genuine salvation is the fruit of the Spirit, and we find that tucked into this letter as well. 
And so Paul, uh, what he's been doing up to this point, leading up to Galatians 5, is that he has been belaboring the Galatian churches, belaboring the point to the Galatian churches, rather, that no one is saved by works of the law. Uh, No one, absolutely no one. It has never happened. And that was of monumental significance, particularly in their context, given that the Judaizers were teaching and seeking to lead the Galatian churches astray by teaching those very points. But Paul comes in and shows that the, that the law of Moses, it cannot save. There is no power in it to save. Moses can only condemn. All the law does is show that we need the gospel. It's not the gospel. It shows that we need good news. The law has never been a means to save. It's never been a means of salvation. Instead, Paul says it is a tutor to lead us to Christ. Its design is to point us to the gospel. And what Paul does as he sets out in Galatians 5 is he's saying that in Christ we are free. He says in Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free, therefore stand firm and do not be subject to a yoke of slavery. The same word that Paul uses there for freedom is the same, it's, it's the word that he uses in Romans six eighteen when he says that we've been freed from sin. We have been freed from sin, we've been freed from the yoke of the law as well. And in light of these realities, Paul encourages the Galatian churches to continue in this race that's been set before them. Uh, There are some ways in which they had laid aside some of their responsibilities. They had been confused because of the false teaching that they were starting to buy into. And and Paul comes along and and, and more than gently encouraging them, he's prodding them. You got to keep going. Uh, You can't uh, can't just uh, kick your feet up and, and lay back. You have to be vigilant in your pursuit of godliness. And this culminates in this discussion, at least for our purposes this morning, in chapter 5 with the discussion of the flesh and the spirit and the contrast that's there. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And so in in many ways, what we're going to be doing is looking at the background. We're going to be looking at the backdrop that leads into the discussion of the fruit of the spirit, which will be the focus of the next five women's brunches, and uh, we'll have uh, the blessing, you'll have the blessing of having a number of different ladies in the church who will be teaching messages uh, to that end, and so uh, very excited about that, and you should be as well. And so uh, Galatians chapter 5, I imagine a number of you were there, but right before, just before we jump into verse 16 and we start reading, I have a question for you all. Um, Has anyone here been to Crater of Diamonds State Park in Arkansas? Has anyone been there? A few hands. How many of you have never heard of Crater of Diamonds State Park in Arkansas? Okay, most of you there. Um, Well, anyways, in Crater of Diamonds State Park, as the name suggests, it is known for diamonds. Um, As of September of 2022, this past year, there were over 35,000 diamonds that had been found in this state park. Uh, That's uh, once it had been, uh, I guess, made a state park in the late 70s. Before that, there were an additional 40,000 diamonds that had been found in that location. So 75,000 diamonds in this location, Crater of Diamonds National Park or State Park. A um, lot of diamonds. Um, the, the largest diamond that's been found there was over 40 carats. Uh, that's a big diamond, um, at which point some of you are thinking, maybe my next trip <laughs> is going to be to Crater of Diamonds State Park in Arkansas. Um, and y- y- you wouldn't be alone in that desire. There are over 100,000 people every year uh, that go to Crater of Diamonds uh, uh, State Park in hope of finding diamonds. But you know what most people find when they're there? Dirt. Dirt. (laughs) Twigs. Rocks of no value. And all that's to say, as we go through this discussion, as we lead into this discussion of of Paul talking about the flesh and the spirit and the contrast that's there, there's, there's a lot of sort of carryover that we could see even from Crater of Diamond State Park. When we consider the flesh, the things of the flesh, That's what covers this state park. It's the dirt. Uh, It's what's natural. It's what's of the world. It's earthly. The natural man's characterized by it. He's like most other people living for the flesh. Nothing special there. But there is a diamond, so to speak, as we come to the fruit of the Spirit. And that is special. And that's found only in a child of God. 
and that's what we're going to work our way to. But we have to get there, and we've got to go through and sort of address the dirt, so to speak, in verses 16 through 21. We'll do that first, and then we'll look just a little bit at verses 22 and 23, of which most of the next uh, five women's brunches will be spent uh, covering, and so we won't do as much today. But anyways, we'll jump in. Galatians 5, 16 and following. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you do not do the things that you want. But if you were led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We'll pause there, and we'll get to the fruit of the Spirit a little bit later. So here we are. We've just read through a lot of sins. We've seen a lot of dirt. And what I want you to recall to mind is what we spoke about moments ago is where Paul begins this chapter. He had just told the Galatians, they have been set free. They've been freed. They have been liberated. They are not captive to these things as they once were. And that's because of Jesus' finished work on the cross and their faith in him. And so Paul is, is giving them a commission here in these verses. He, he, while they were once bound, these individuals were bound by the flesh. They aren't anymore. Uh, in Romans 6.22, Paul told the church in Rome, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have your benefit leading to sanctification and the end eternal life. At one point, all the Galatians could do was living according to the flesh, being unredeemed. And that was the same for you and me as well. They were dirt living for dirt, if you want to think of it that way. We were too. They used to live for that, living for the flesh, but now they are to walk by the Spirit. That's how they were. That's not who they are now. And walking by the Spirit, that, that is really the grandest commission the best commission that we could ever expect from Paul to tell us here, because what he's doing is he's calling them and telling them that they are to follow the Lord. They're to live for him. Thomas Constable says of this verse, this is one of the most important and helpful verses on Christian living in all of the Bible. I think he's right. As you walk on your two legs throughout your life, so too you are to walk in or live in the spirit. You are to abide in him. Now, some people, as we come to this passage, they, they actually want to see this passage that we're approaching as, as really a, a hands-off passage. No action required on our part. We're simply endowed with the fruit of the Spirit in salvation. Now we let go and let God. But that's not what Paul says here. There, there's an imperative verb here. It's a command that he gives you for your joy. You, believer, walk in the Spirit. You have to move forward in a particular fashion, all the while recognizing the one who strengthens us to this end is the Lord himself. Uh, we move, but the Lord is the one who moves us. I think Spurgeon said that. Now, Paul says it this way, in a perfect way, in Philippians 2, 12 through 13. He says, So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so that's the idea. And when you live in this way, you, 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 you won't do what? You won't follow the flesh. That's what Paul finishes the thought off with in verse 16. Anyone who says that this is a hands-off approach, solely a hands-off approach where, where we don't need to move in any direction, that would be going against other passages as well, like Ephesians 6, where we're to take up the full armor of God. Passivity in this life is, uh, if it's not walking in the flesh, it's the pathway there. 
But in contrast, we're to actively walk by the Spirit. And in so doing, that's where victory is found, the victory that's found at the end of verse 16. And I like what Timothy George says here concerning our victory over the flesh. He says, but where does the believer acquire these, the resources for this kind of victorious Christian living? Modern religious pedagogy offers many answers, a winsome personality, one's innate abilities, advanced degrees in theological education, special seminars on higher Christian life, social activism, spiritual psychotherapy in others. Paul's answer is the Holy Spirit. It's like, amen. The reason that the world's means to subdue the flesh through psychology, various counseling practices, and other forms of consequence, the reason those don't work is because they don't address the heart. And they don't change the heart. Only the Lord, the Spirit, can do that. And He's done that for His people. You are not the same person that you used to be. Praise God for that. And I'm not either. And I praise God for that. But verse 16 inevitably will bring up questions for some. We know who the Holy Spirit is, the third person of the Trinity, God, very God. But what is the flesh? And what precisely is walking in the Spirit? Well, here, effectively, the flesh refers to the way that we used to live in sin. Uh, In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says this, and speaking of salvation, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So that's interesting. So old things have passed away. And then Paul says in Galatians 2.20, which is just before this text, that his old self, his old way of life, he himself had been crucified with Christ. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, uh, referring to his physical being there, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So that's one of the blessings of salvation. It's a great blessing. But Paul knows, as you do, that while we are redeemed, while we are new creatures in Christ, nevertheless, there is a battle that remains. There's a battle that remains in this life. There's a battle that rages on. Paul knows that the Christian life isn't a cakewalk. Like, yes, we have joy in Christ, fullness of joy found only in him. He has come that we would have joy, John 11 or 15, 11. But that doesn't mean the Christian life is always easy. We still sin. If anyone claims he's without sin, the truth is not in him. John makes clear in 1 John 1, 8 through 10. We will be without sin and glory, but that's not the case right now. And it's not the Spirit who's sinning in us. No, you and I are responsible for that. And so Paul says that when we sin, when we commit sin, that is the flesh that's living in the flesh. The flesh is our ability to sin. It's not our physical skin on us. It's not a reference to flesh and bones. There can be times when the word is used in that fashion. Paul just did it in Galatians 2.20, speaking of the life that he lives physically. But Paul's usage here isn't isn't something that's physical. He's using, speaking of a faculty that that is still, um, uh, that it still belongs to us. Uh, We are still, while we've been redeemed, Uh, We've not been perfected. And so, for example, to help illustrate that Paul's not speaking about our bodies, he says in Romans 8, 6, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. He isn't saying that unbelievers are just always thinking about their bodies. Um, Now, you know, they, they can be, you know, in a vain sense, but that's not the idea. The term is speaking of sin and our ability to sin. He says in verses 7 through 8, Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. And that's where we know it's not physical, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are of the flesh are not able to please God. So if he's speaking about just physical bodies there, those that are in the flesh are not able to please God, none of you are able to please God. He's definitely not talking about physical bodies here. He's speaking about something that is immaterial when he talks about the flesh. He says that those who are living for sin, living in sin, they're not redeemed. Therefore, they can't please God. And so Paul's point is, don't be like that because you aren't that any longer. You've been redeemed. So we, that is, that's what the flesh is. And so the dichotomy, again, is with the Spirit walking in the Spirit. And so what does that mean exactly? What does that look like? Paul says in a similar passage in Ephesians 6 or 5.18, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. It's similar. 
So we are to be full of the Spirit. That means we're to be controlled by the Spirit. You think of a sailboat on a lake, and then the wind comes along and blows in the sails. There's control that's taking place, and that's what our lives are to be. We're to be full of the Spirit. At which point you might say, well, practically, like, what does that look like in a believer? How do we know if we're full of the Spirit? Well, the answer is, it's right there in verse 16. Are you walking? Like, are you walking with the Lord? Are you seeking to abide in Him, following His Word from the heart? Not just superficially, but because you love Him, you're, you're following after Him. If, you walk, if you're doing that, then you are walking in the Spirit. And to walk in the Spirit is to be Christian. The Spirit Himself, He's the one who moved the authors uh, of Scripture based on 2 Peter 1, uh, 19 through 21, to, to write these God-inspired words. They're from Him, the Spirit. If you're living in line with what he has said, then you're walking with him. You're walking by the Spirit. In this, this verse here, verse 16, it, it may not seem like it at first, but it's so important because everything that follows, including our discussion of the fruit of the Spirit, it is all connected back to this verse. It's as though everything stems back to this capstone verse. In order to understand everything that follows in our study, we do need to understand this one well. So we'll spend a little bit extra time there. But we'll go on to verse 17. Verse 17, Paul, he further elaborates the, the, the contrast and really the opposition that the flesh and the spirit have toward one another. This is explaining the, the, the war that's going on inside of you, the spirit uh, that you are seeking to follow, the Lord himself directing you to that end. Like you have that desire, you want to walk with him because you have been born again. But there's still this inclination you, in you to sin. There is a desire there as well. If there was no desire, you would never sin. Now, if anyone's here and doesn't have any idea what I'm speaking about, it might be because the battle that I'm speaking about, it only exists in believers. This battle here is not just speaking of conscience and knowing right from wrong. This is a battle to honor God from the heart, the very thing unbelievers don't care to do. Now, every once in a while, Nietzsche will get something right. And he said this, you are the worst enemy you can encounter. Uh, put in a more modern sort of vernacular, you're, you're your own worst enemy. And, and there is some truth in that statement. Uh, Spurgeon once gave a, a pretty grand illustration. He says this, a garrison is not free from danger while it has an enemy lodged within. You may bolt all your doors and fasten all your windows, but if the thieves have placed even a little child within doors who can draw the bolts for them, the house is still unprotected. All the sea outside a ship cannot do it damage till the water enters within and fills the hold. Hence, it's clear our greatest danger is from within. All the devils in hell and tempters on earth could do us no injury if there were no corruption in our nature or in us. The sparks will fall harmlessly if there's no tender. Alas, our heart is our greatest enemy. This is the little home-born thief. So to summarize what Spurgeon is saying the battle is significant. It rages on within us, and we need to be aware of it. But more than just being aware of it, we, we need to be in, engaged in it. Like we have to have not only have the desire to walk in the Spirit, but we have to be diligent to conduct ourselves in such a way that we're seeking to do just that. We are new creatures, and, and where the flesh once ruled over us, Spirit has now taken residence in us, and the flesh is opposed to our new master. And so we read about this war that's going on in verse 17. The flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. We understand that, and then we read, so that you do not do the things that you want or the things that you please. What does that mean? It's a really interesting end to this verse here. Is this a reference to not sinning or to not living righteously? or put differently, to not sinning or living unrighteously. What is that desire? Is it a reference to both? There's a divide among believers. Some say that the flesh prevents us from living righteously and in, in walking in the Spirit. Others say the Spirit pre prevents us from walking or living unrighteously in living for the flesh. Now, of course, the Spirit's more powerful than the flesh. We see that in verse 16. Those that are uh, that belong to the Lord are never overtaken by the flesh. We know that from what we read on in verse 21 and how it ends. Paul says in Romans 8, 3 through 4, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, 
so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's how we live. That is the the normal pattern of a believer's life. So what does Paul have in mind here? Um, I think in verse 17, I I actually think both are in view. Uh, The nearest referent in this verse is these. uh, These are in opposition to one another so that you do not do the things that you want or that you please. And I think that's the most direct, direct appeal. Because the flesh and the spirit are at war as believers, we don't do what we want. And Richard Longnecker puts it this way, the flesh opposes the spirit with the desire that people don't want or do, excuse me, the flesh opposes the spirit with the desire that people not do what they want to do when guided by the spirit. And the spirit opposes the flesh with the desire that people not do what they want to do when guided by the flesh. I think that's the idea. Now, of course, we're not to be led by or live in the flesh, but anytime we sin, we show ourselves to not be walking in the spirit. To which Paul continues in verse 18 by saying that those that are led by the Spirit, which is to be our disposition, our normal disposition, uh, are not under the law. Now, that may seem a little strange just if you're just looking at verses 16 and 17, but again, the larger context makes uh, makes the reasoning for this abundantly clear. Uh, Paul's point is that those that follow Jesus do not live ultimately for Moses. Uh, What that means is, again, no one is justified by keeping the law. That's the greater argument from this book. Paul's saying, effectively, you are not under the 613 commands of the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, Some people want to, you know, I think it's helpful to see a tripartite division of the law just for our understanding's sake, but it's not as though there are two parts, the ceremonial and civil aspects of the law. Those are gone But all those moral laws from Moses, they're still there. Keep in mind, the moral law of God is a reflection of who God is. It was wrong to murder before Moses ever came around. And we know that to be the case from from even what we read in God's, well, with Cain and Abel, we knew murder was wrong. Uh, We knew it was wrong from, uh, with Noah, with the the commands given to Noah. Um, And so it's not as though with the moral commands that, you know, this is not just a case to, you know, a call to live in sin by no means, Um, but uh, Moses is done. Moses is gone. The law was all or nothing, and we see that in the Bible. And and James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law, doesn't say for whoever keeps the moral law, whoever keeps the civil law, uh, ceremonial law, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. It's not just the Ten Commandments in view, 613 commands. You're guilty of all if you stumble in one point. It should be a concern if you're here in an unbeliever and you've not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Elsewhere in Galatians 5.3, this same book, Paul says, And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision, he is under obligation to keep the whole law. All of it. But the Christian doesn't have that yoke. We follow the Lord and we do not submit to Moses because we're under the new covenant. We are under a better covenant. As the book of Hebrews said, Moses has been made obsolete, as the book of Hebrews says. And so that that, that really is central to Paul's argument that we're justified by faith, particularly because the false teaching that was going on was promoting obedience to Moses as, as though through obeying Moses, as though through being circumcised, one was justified. And Paul says, no, that's wrong. It's not through obedience to the law that anyone is declared right by God. Moses saves no one. Only faith in Christ does that. And so when we walk in the Spirit... We are, we are effectively walking by faith. We're living for the Lord. We are not under the law. We're not seeking to earn righteousness through the law. Because those that seek to earn righteousness through the law, they actually aren't walking in the Spirit. They're walking in the flesh. At which point we get back into the mud and dirt, the stuff that's all over Crater of Diamond State Park. This is what the flesh looks like. Paul gives us a very detailed picture of it in verses 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, things like these, all of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is effectively the dark side, like of Galatians 5, 22 through 23, and there's a lot here. This is not an all-encompassing list, though. 
For example, murder is not seen on the list, but murder is certainly not of the spirit, it's of the flesh. Paul's just giving us a summary. He's giving us a summary here. He gives us other summaries elsewhere of what the flesh looks like. But don't miss the end. Those that live in these things or walk in these realities will not, guaranteed, without a doubt, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's about as serious as it gets. You will die in your sins if you are living in these realities. And if you're here this morning and you see your life in this list, you know yourself to be living for these realities, then you will be judged and you will die in your sins. But if you come to Christ, if you come to the one that we're talking about, the very one who has come and who has given the Spirit, if you come to him and believe in him, he forgives all who come to him by faith. Jesus, he, he lived the righteous life that you and I were called to live. He did not stumble in one point of the law. No, not one point. He was perfectly faithful to the Lord. He fulfilled the law, and he is the end of righteousness to all who believe in him because we have found our righteousness in him, as Paul speaks of in Romans 10, 4, and in other places. You cannot have your sins forgiven by adhering to the law. Keep in mind, so I have no idea when I started. So I, I'm, I'm good, like... I'm going to try and move fast. I know we're talking about the gospel. I don't want to move too fast here, and that's part of my point, but I'll just try to try to be cautious here. Like, there are sometimes, some people will try to earn their way with God in this life. They will try to work so as to be able to bring their good deeds to God on the last day and say, God, see all these things that I've done for you. But the problem with that logic is God's standard was perfection. If you just show him all of these things, that was what was required of you. He is the master. And he has called you to live perfectly. And so if you come and say, here's how I live perfectly, and here are all the ways I didn't, you have fallen short. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Even the good deeds that you bring before the Lord, the good things that you have done, they are but filthy rags in his sight if you have not done them out of a desire to honor him. There's only one way to be made right with God, and it is through the man, Christ Jesus, who lived without sin and died for sinners like you and me, and he has risen from the grave, and it is through believing in him as your substitute, the one that the Mosaic law pointed toward through all the sacrifices that were performed and the shedding of blood, and through the, through the sacrifices, these seemingly endless sacrifices of bulls and goats in Hebrews 10, 4, we read that they can never take away sin. Only one can do that. Jesus Christ, and if you come to him, you can have your sins forgiven this morning by believing upon him for eternal life. And it's, it's so important because if you don't, again, we see your fate here in verse 21. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will be judged. And so this is what the flesh produces. Uh, I mean, the, what the flesh produces in verses 19 through 21 is, is absolutely not desirable. It, it's what leads to death. It's what you lived in before salvation. Like, like, it's so much more pleasurable to follow after the Lord. It's what you desire to do now because you've been saved by him. You don't love these things anymore. It doesn't mean that you're not without sin, but your desires have changed. Your affections have changed in salvation. But again, it doesn't mean that there isn't still a battle that goes on. And so the encouragement here from Paul for the Galatians for you this morning is don't be wooed by the flesh. Do not be tempted by it. Don't be wooed by dirt when you can have diamonds in the spirit. J.C. Ryle once said, sin looks pleasant at first. We're too apt to forget that temptation to sin will rarely present itself to us in its true color, saying, I'm your deadly enemy, and I want to ruin you forever in hell. <laughs> oh, no. Sin comes to us like Judas with a kiss, like Joab with outstretched hand and flattering words. The forbidden fruit seemed good and desirable to Eve, yet it cast her out of Eden. Walking idly on his palace roof seemed, har seemed harmless enough to David, yet it ended in adultery and murder. Sin rarely seems like sin at first beginnings. Let us then watch and pray lest we fall into temptation. I just think it's a good and healthy word in light of reading through these sins. And we, we know they're dirt. We know what they are. But just a reminder that we wouldn't be led astray, that we would be prayerful, and that we would be on guard. Because this isn't a war or a battle that goes on, you know, just for like a couple days out of the week or, you know, hey, you know, it's like, you know, like countries go to war and they're at war for a year or two, maybe three or four. But then there's, you know, some, some superficial peace. This is a battle that's always going on. It is a battle that goes on every single day. We have to be aware of it and live accordingly. That just knowing that this is going on, this pull for our affection. This battle has been going on for you this morning. 
maybe even here among the ladies that you're, you're interacting with. It may have happened before you got here today. We have to be on guard that we are not walking in the flesh. We have to be so aware of it. Paul has just shown us what effectively the fruit of the flesh. He says deeds of the flesh, but effectively this is the fruit. This is what you bear. You reap what you sow. If you live in this way, this is what will come from it. It is bad fruit. Jesus says in Luke 6, 43 through 45, there, for there is no good tree which produces, is displaying and bearing like this repetitively bad fruit. Nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a bramble bush. The good man out of, his, out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from the abundance of his heart. You think about in Genesis how animals reproduce according to their kind, so too can trees produce in this illustration one or two kinds of fruit, but they'll only produce that. Either you will have good fruit and be known for it or bad fruit and be known for it. This is speaking of lifestyle practice. It's not speaking of perfection. But these are the two options. Paul's not saying that we'll be sinless, neither is Jesus, but the one that lives for Christ, in Christ, in the Spirit, will look markedly different from the world. So Paul says these, there are deeds of the flesh. We know they lead to bad fruit. Um, and, and Paul is effectively, when you see that list, that's what we looked like before salvation. It's something that Paul is telling the Galatians um, by extension. You know, This is something you know well because it's something you used to live in, but you don't any longer. So you should know very, very well what your life shouldn't look like. And so at that point, at this point, we'll go ahead and move to the diamonds. We'll be very brief here, and, and then we'll conclude. Uh, we're speaking of the fruit of the Spirit. And I, a helpful observation before we read verses 22 through 23, Martin Luther once said, the apostle says not the works of the Spirit. As he said, the works or deeds of the flesh. He adorns these Christian virtues with a more honorable name, calling them the fruit of the Spirit. For they bring with them the most excellent fruits and maximum usefulness, for they that have them give glory to God, and with the same do allure and provoke others to embrace the doctrine and faith of Christ. So let's go ahead and read verses 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentle, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So... The fruit of the Spirit is antithetical to that of the world. These are the characteristics and marks of the godly. And, and note that Paul doesn't call them the fruits of the Spirit. That's important because this is a package deal that the godly have and are given the moment they're indwelt by the Spirit in salvation. Spurgeon says this, The great artist has sketched fruit that never grows in the gardens of earth until they are planted by the Lord from heaven. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture there of what happens in salvation. God plants a garden in us. What this means practically is there's no such thing as a Christian who isn't patient. There's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't have peace or self-control. Yes, there will be times when you sin in these areas in the battle that rages on. But the Christian on the whole is patient. Why? It's because you've been born from above. Why? Because God tells you so right here. If God has taken up residence in you, if you abide in him and he abides in you, then you will be patient and will become increasingly so. In the moment of salvation, you have the fruit of the Spirit. Think of the beginnings of a fire, like without using lighter fluid, okay? Just like the beginnings of a, of a small fire. It's small, it takes time to grow, but, but given the right elements, it will grow. God will fan the flame of the fire that's lit in the Christian, and the fire will grow into a roaring blaze. You become more of, of the each. You become more of these attributes that you've already become or been declared to be. I guess in the reception of the fruit of the Spirit, and with these, with what we see here with the fruit of the Spirit, these aren't qualities that you have to grit your teeth to coerce. Sure, we're mindful of them. And we desire these things to grow in us, these, these qualities, because they show us Jesus. Like when I see the fruit of the Spirit, I see Jesus. And I hope you see him as well when you look at, the, when you look at this description. Jesus is the perfect representation of the Pauline picture. 
We want to be more like him. Therefore, we want to show forth these attributes and qualities all the more. So the fruit of the Spirit, like, it's not something that we have to grit our teeth to coerce. The fruit of the Spirit's not like doing lines on a chalkboard after school for punishment. They're natural to the believer as the works of the flesh are natural to the unbeliever. Phil Newton once observed, bearing fruit is natural for fruit trees. They need not strain to produce fruit. You never find a grove of apple or peach trees attending conferences on bearing fruit. <laughs> Nor do you find fruit trees manipulating one another with browbeating words and attempts to co- convince a tree to produce fruit. The most natural thing in the world is for a fruit tree to bear its own fruit. That's precisely what Christians do because we've been born again. We delight in the Lord. We love him. We want to follow him. We want to make much of him with our lives and we desire the things he desires. Now, I won't go through each of these characteristics of the new birth um, because that's what you're going to be going through throughout this next year during the rest of these women's brunches. Suffice it to say, a lot's going to be considered here. Like, what does it mean? What does it mean for a Christian to be known for love and joy? What about patience, parents? What about self-control, teenagers and young adults? What about peace and the various varying circumstances of life? These are all the kinds of matters that will be discussed. But take comfort in knowing, just as we close, God has given you such a gift. God has given you the most tremendous gift of all in giving you himself. It's certainly in the cross of Christ, because it's by the cross of Christ that we, we have him in us. But uh, what I mean most particularly is take comfort in knowing that God, very God, the living God has taken up residence in you. And that is an overwhelming reality. Uh, The reason that you have the fruit of the Spirit is because you have the Spirit who produces fruit. You've been sealed in Him. The proof of your daughtership in Christ is seen in you having the Spirit and your union with Him. I think having a study on the fruit of the Spirit, this should be an inherently practical study. Um, while we all have, been, have the fruit of the Spirit, there's always room for us to grow and excel still more. And while bearing fruit is natural to a fruit tree, there's still a battle that goes on for our affection and our display of the spiritual fruit that we have. And so in studying who God is and in studying the fruit that He provides, through doing those things, we will be transformed more into the image of Jesus. And so I think it will be a tremendous blessing uh, for you to pause and to spend time uh, thinking through, develop, or uh, pondering on, meditating on the fruit of the Spirit, and in so doing, uh, being more mindful of the Lord who fills and strengthens us. And so I think this will be a blessing of a study. Uh, very excited for the study uh, about the fruit of the Spirit because I just think there's so much that we all have to, that we always have to learn and grow uh, concerning. Uh, yeah, these qualities and uh, these qualities with reference to our our own um, reflection of the Lord. And so, that being said, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll transition. Father, we're thankful for who you are. We are so thankful that in in seeing these qualities, in, in seeing the fruit of the Spirit, this package deal, we are reminded of the great grace and love that you have shown towards us. The great grace because we were your enemies and Christ died for us. Uh, We're so thankful for that and the great love that you have shown towards us in not leaving us as we are. Uh, Father, we're reminded that the work you have begun in us will be brought about to completion in the day of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we know that we have a, um, a confirmation of that process even in having received uh, your spirit and received the fruit. Uh, that he's born in our lives. Father, I pray that through this study, uh, through considering the fruit of the Spirit, uh, there would be ample spiritual growth that takes place. I pray that there would be a greater view of you and your grace and your kindness towards us. I, Father, I pray that this would, lead to, this would lead to further sanctification and that there would be more praise that comes as a, a fruit of the lips from your people because of a study like this one. Father, I pray even now for all who will be preparing studies uh, to this end. Father, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that they would, you would comfort them in yourself, and I pray that you would change and mold them even through the process. Father, I pray through this study today that you would change and mold us. I pray that if there wasn't excitement before, I pray there would be now in just dwelling upon who you are 
and what you desire to be um, uh, fanned in us uh, with reference to our, um, um, uh, our reflection of you in this world. Father, we're thankful for this time. I pray you bless the time of discussion that follows and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, before we jump into the, 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 the breakout questions, uh, I do apologize for going so long. I don't know when I started, but I know I went over 30 minutes, and I didn't intend to do that. Um, I think even just before coming out, I was just adding more things and stuff, and so... <laughs> Um, just, uh, but, uh, there's just always, there's always more. And that's the difficulty is, uh, what do you cut and what do you leave? Uh, and what do you, what do you add and what do you not add? But, um, uh, you'll want to be here for the next woman's brunch because as I think Michelle mentioned earlier, we, we do have a book for you all. It is a book on the fruit of the spirit that I, I think will be very helpful for you. And so if you're here next time, uh, you will get one. And so, uh, just, uh, an encouragement to be here next time, but I do have discussion questions, um, Michelle, would it work best if I just pass them? I'll, I, maybe I'll read them, and then I can pass them out. So the questions are, are these. Uh, Paul says that we're to walk by the Spirit, and then that we are led by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, and 18. How do these realities play out in the life of a believer? Second question, why does Paul juxtapose the Spirit to the law? What are biblical tests that you can use to ensure you're being led by the Spirit and not seeking righteousness through the law? And then three, consider other passages that speak about fruitfulness. And I have a few listed there. What is God's view of spiritual fruit and why? Um, you do not have to go through all of these questions. Like if there's just one y'all get stuck on and y'all are just talking about it, by all means, continue to talk about it. Uh, these are meant to be discussion starters uh, and don't want you to feel constrained by them. And so those are the questions. And uh, I guess we'll go through these. And then after you discuss a time of prayer, is that... So after you go through the questions and spend some time, if you could spend some time, additional time, as you're able, I know we've gone a bit long, but uh, uh, ask prayer requests from one another and then spend some time in prayer with one another. Sound good? All right, wonderful. Well, I'll go ahead and pass these out and y'all feel free to discuss.